This episode is brought to you by Pedro Arrupe and his legendary quote, I do not resign that when I die, the world will continue as if I had not lived. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hello, my people. ¿Cómo están, damas y caballeros? Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, where I welcome people with remarkable stories for amazingly vulnerable conversations. Today, I have the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the highly capable Juan Camilo Poveda. Juan Camilo was born and raised in Colombia. Here's a little bit of his bio, just so you know. Growing up in the Colombian context, from a young age, he became aware of the critical social injustices that hinder many people's capacity to attain social mobility. Since then, he participated in multiple leadership and service camps, serving youth and rural communities. These experiences allowed him to discover his passion for service, being an agent of change and education. Since he immigrated to Canada, he has worked with community organizations in the coordination of programs geared towards youth empowerment. He is committed to making transformative experiences like the ones he has been able to access and have defined his life, accessible to everyone. And he is also, according to me, <laughs> one of the kindest leaders most positive intentional leaders that I know I've been wanting to have him on the podcast for the longest time how are you my friend welcome thank you for letting true I'm okay how are you doing very good man this is this is just it's about to change your life how are you gonna deal with so much fame after this <laughs> we'll see we'll see <laughs> man it's it's such a pleasure to have you here we've opted we've made a decision to record this in English because Juan, Juan Camilo has a, a wealth of knowledge of so many opportunities in Canada that a lot of newcomers, immigrants can access, really everybody. And we were going to do it in Spanish for our beloved not working to networking community and, and everybody else, but we realized that why restrict it to only Spanish speakers? So we decided to do it in English and obviously most Latinos will be able to listen because we speak English here in North America. Considering the that the majority of the podcast listeners are immigrants or newcomers in Canada. So, why Canada? Where are you from in Colombia? And where did this love for service start? Okay, um, so I was born and raised in Bogota, in yeah. the capital city of Colombia. Um, growing up, I I had the opportunity to go to a, a good school that um, had a lot of focus on serving others. The whole mentality of the school was very service-oriented. Oh, really? What's it were, called? Uh, it's called San Bartolomé, La Merced. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to San Bartolomé La Merced, everybody <laughs> there listening to us right now. Yeah, um, I I think that I was very lucky to go to that school. Um, it definitely shaped how I see the world and, and what I do. Really? Absolutely. I think there were a lot of opportunities to connect with people from different backgrounds um, yeah. through some activities that were placed like throughout school years um, where you would go and... Um, Learn about like realities in in different contexts, uh, serving them. So in this case, like in Bogota, like other areas of Latin America, people who go to good schools, like mm -hmm. or have the opportunity, like you and I, sometimes are in this bubble, and mm -hmm. they think, or they want to believe, that everything is like that, even though poverty is rampant and a lot of opportunities are, are just for the people who can afford mm -hmm. them. Yes, that is so very much the case. So through your school, you were able to see other things and the reality of Colombia. Um, yeah, partly. I would say that I'm sure in most places in Latin America, like 
you can just really isolate yourself like although you can to a certain extent um, kind of like manage to be surrounded by people from similar backgrounds there's no way you don't see social injustices everywhere yeah. like on the street like you can see people in different circumstances since a very young age struggling so you can't like really ignore that that whole um, reality exists um, but I think like the combination of being aware that that exists because you can simply not ignore it like when in a traffic light you see someone younger than you when you're a kid yeah, um, asking for for some help um, and also the combination of being able to learn about different things like through school helped me become aware of like social injustices and become interested in it yeah although for sure like I think it's a matter of um, decision like uh, it needs to be intentional to become aware and take action because I think although that was like a focus in the school there's people that are just not interested in that sort of thing and people can't just go about their lives thinking that things are just uh, okay for for everyone because they're okay for them yeah and how did when when you were graduating high school or or when you were going through eighth ninth tenth grade as you get closer to twelfth grade did Canada was was Canada always in your mind or did it somebody came for like a uh, university fair and they planted that seed or your parents love mm-hmm. Canada for some reason why Canada that's a good question I thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's I think what, that's what I do <laughs> <laughs> um, I had always wanted to travel um, I love traveling it's it's a passion of mine and I think that I really wanted to see other places um, I had been to Canada once for like um, a few weeks like a month about a month um, studying English for a little bit when I was younger and I had loved it um, I went to Windsor Ontario for for mm-hmm. a little bit um, and I had liked it a lot but I didn't really think of like coming here to study my post-secondary education I just thought of like taking a break after high school um, to study English like, like see um, a different reality taking a break really from like that competition mindset that I think a lot of people um, back home have which is just like you gotta graduate as soon as you can so that you can get into school as soon as you can so that then you graduate as, as soon, soon as, as you, you can, can to get another job and so everything's like a competition based on your age which is like ingraining that in the ages and back home as well right like it's a reality that the younger you are the more likely you are to get a job and that sort of thing which I get like um, influences people's mindsets but I I wanted to take a break from that and not engage in in that um, so I decided to take a break to study English wow. and then I was gonna go back home to study university there <laughs> but things changed when I got here so and, and you were gonna go back home and 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 go to university in Colombia yeah so the initial plan was to just do like a, which is very popular in Latin America like a year abroad or, or like six months. six months yeah yeah six months and what year was that this was 2016 2016 which is maybe what did I did I meet you there no, I think we met in 2017, like late 2017. Ed, okay, amazing. So mm-hmm. what happened when you first arrived? So the game plan was come here for six months to study English to, or to... Because you need to somehow apply mm-hmm. for the visa, right? Yep, yeah, yeah. And it was to, to study English. And then what happened? So I came as a tourist to study like a three-month course because you don't need a um, student visa if you're going to study for less yes. than like six months, I believe. And how, how, where, where did you study? I studied at a school called English School of Canada, mm-hmm. around St. Clair and Young. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's exactly, like, my plan was just to come here and then go back uh, after, like, three months or something um, to study university there. Mm-hmm. But then when I got here, it turns out that that program that I was in was to go into college or university. Uh, was like a pathway program. And I didn't even know what college was or like wow. what it was about, but I learned about what college was there, and then I decided to apply for it. So for the people who are listening and may not know the difference, college versus university, typically, not always, but typically, university programs here, when you come out of high school, you can do like an undergraduate program, which is typically four years. In college, you can do programs that are two years, three one years, year, year. three years. Mm-hmm. And the good thing about doing that nowadays is that it's become a very popular 
pathway for people to come to Canada because often, not not always, for in my case, for example, if when I graduated at U of T for four years of studying there, I got a almost automatic, not always, but a three-year work permit. And if you study for two years at a college, you can get a two-year sometimes work permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you study for one year, you get a one-year work yep. permit. And usually, when you get a work permit, then you work. I mean, it's another discussion about how you get the job and if you get a good job or mm -hmm. a meaningful job. But in my case, when I was when I graduated, I went to UFT for four years, got a postgraduate work permit for three years. I ended up working at Scotiabank for one year full, I mean, seven years eventually, but right away one year full time and then you can apply for your permanent residence if you work here so a lot of people who come here they use this this Path. opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to stay here so once you heard of college what what was going through your mind what programs were you interested in what were you going to study in university in colombia first of all uh, i was not going to study social work which is what i do now what i studied wow. now, what were you going to study i was thinking of maybe political sciences that was wow like my number one option what do, do, what do your parents do uh they're food engineers wow. oh yeah i told you about sofia yeah yeah yes yes shout out to sofia lara Costa Rican <laughs> friend who is a uh, not sure if she's a food engineer, but she has a lot of I, she has a bunch of masters in cheese and food and everything. Okay, so you come here for those three months. You hear about college, and what's going through your mind? What what opportunities open up for you? Um, I remember thinking about whether to apply or not for a while uh, because obviously I knew that life was gonna change. Life was gonna be very different. Um, just coming here by myself and becoming like more independent um, it was just like a big shift in my head that and I was as an international about. student too, right. the fees are, mm -hmm. are expensive mm -hmm. and I was thinking also of like what programs to get into here because college doesn't have the same programs as university so political science was not an option um, I don't think that I was like I mean I don't know what I'm gonna do in the future uh, I think that there is well some of the things that were in my mind at the time and I think are very much still in my mind is how to serve people, how, how to help people, how to impact the world in order to make it a better place, mm -hmm. a more just place. Um, and I think that can be done through many, many ways, like arguably through every field. Yeah. Uh, there's ways to help people, like regardless of what you do. Um, but to me, it was important to feel like I was making a significant change and um, in like terms of the depth of the impact in people's lives but also like how many people I was able to impact because there is such a huge need in the world to make things better um, so I thought maybe through policy uh, I could achieve that back home I think that I was also not considering social work back there because I feel like the circumstances for the work are different um, and so I, I wasn't really thinking about that um, but here when I was looking at the colleges and the programs they offer yeah I was interested in social service work, which is like a two-year diploma yeah. uh, that is related, very much related to social work. Um, so I applied for that because I thought maybe I can I can do that here. And obviously, like in I knew Seneca. at Seneca, at yeah, Seneca. at Seneca College, yeah. Um, I knew that it wasn't gonna be like I think that nonprofits and social services are rarely. If I, I've never heard of any country where it's like a high-paying job or whatever it is. But that was not my ambition. My ambition was just to like do it and make a living mm -hmm. and like I think also be happy right like the reason why I'm considering what why I was considering these things and I think that I'm still looking to like what's coming next is because um, it makes me feel very happy I'm, I'm happy when I serve others and, mm -hmm. and when I travel so what was in my mind is how can I make this like my full-time thing <laughs> and make a living out of that so I thought that's as a possibility to achieve that I think you're a, I think you're one of the people that that you're you're a trailblazer, man. You're a pioneer because I I think from and nothing wrong with people who are from where we are and including myself, where my priority and and the conversation that I had with my dad at the time was like el, el, the typical like okay do something donde no te mueras de hambre, no like and comedy falls into that like mm. te vas a morir de hambre. You're not going to be yeah. able to. 
the because back home where we come from, you don't hear a lot of a lot of comedians that are making money, mm-hmm. or that you don't even hear of that as an option of mm-hmm. of doing that for the rest of your life. Maybe you hear them when people are like, oh, famous comedians that are forty or fifty that've been doing that for f- f- twenty years on the mm-hmm. side, but to come here. I I did banking. I did finance, mm-hmm. which was something that I could the that was like in the market or whatever. And then only after doing it seven years, then lots of other opportunities start to come to mind in Canada. We're like maybe I could maybe I could pursue this. You know, mm-hmm. this is a great place to. And and even for people who come here when they're forty, this is a great place to to reinvent themselves and awesome. and to ask yourself what do I really love, and. And could I do this for the rest of my life? So I think you're very brave to have picked that, and you have a lot of self awareness to be able to, at a very young age, to to have identified like you know what, I know I love this, I'm good at this, and I'm gonna pursue this because not a lot of people do that. Mm-hmm. So you start at Seneca, and how does the Teach to learn, and how 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 do we connect paths? How did you mm-hmm. how did you go to teach to learn? Which, for the people listening to us, it's a um, it's a great organization at, at Keelan Finch. Uh, they do work all all, all around Toronto, but and uh, North York. But the, where I started with them was at Keelan Finch, with Pilar and Matias and and a lot of great people who who correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I explain it is like it's an organization that helps. Latinos or, or Hispanics uh, adapt into Canada and they started this because there was an alarming stat around 2010 I think maybe where 40% of Latino uh, high schoolers were dropping out of high school so they started this organization to help them tutor, tutor them because they were dropping out for a variety of reasons but mostly because they had no mentoring because their parents were maybe they their parents were were newcomers as well who didn't speak English they were working two three jobs at times and how are you going to help your kid do homework if if you don't even speak mm-hmm. English mm-hmm. And, and you're trying to get by and surviving with two or three jobs so the 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 program was successful and now they help parents as well and they help uh, kids mm-hmm. as well. How did, okay, correct me if I'm wrong with all the things that I said, but uh, how did you get to teach to learn? Yeah, I think you did a great job explaining it. Um, they've done so much work uh, with the Latinx community here um, out of love and like... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really, I feel super, super blessed that I connected with teach to learn first. Um, yeah. Because then it opened so many doors that... Um, kind of like got me to where I'm at right now in life and I got the opportunity to meet so many amazing people yeah um, incredible yeah so they they tried to really use the drop with rate of Latinx youth um, through different workshops and that includes also supporting parents and uh, little kids like in tutoring programs right now those programs are in a hold because of funding issues like with COVID and everything um, but yes that's that's the point of the organization to like serve serve youth um, doing the groundwork. It's a, it's a very grassroots organization yes. and, and it's amazing. And I got connected with them. Um, I was in school and I heard someone just like speaking Spanish uh, in the hallway. Um, and it's just very natural for, I don't know what you have experienced, but I know like for most Latinx people that I know, it's just like, you hear someone speaking Spanish, you just talk to them like, hey, what's up? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that happened. Um, and like this person, I don't know, I, I don't know if you remember him, Alejandro. Um, Alejandro, he, yeah, Mendoza. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. He he told me about teach to learn. I I told him we talked we talked like he was um into photography and media. Yes. And he was doing work for teach to learn at the time. I think he was like handling social media or something. And I told him about my program, and he was like, "You should come." Maybe I told him that I needed to do a placement um, like later in the year, and he he introduced me. He just told wow. me to go. It was very close to school around like not so far from here and um i i went to one of the workshops and it was like an instant match i remember feeling like (laughs) very welcome um that workshop that i went to i remember 
there wasn't like that many people. There was mainly like kind of like the core team at the time, um, which were just like very, very nice and smart people. Um, that made me feel very welcome. Yes. And, yeah. Pilar and everybody, Susie, uh, Angie, Angie uh, yeah, yeah. everybody has been so... You could argue really that that not working to networking was born there mm. because in 2013, I did a resume critique workshop for Teach to Learn and I organized the whole thing. I brought like 10, 20, 10 people from Scotiabank to tutor a bunch of people there. And it was just like an instant match. I went there too and to to do some some I think I did a speaking with confidence. I don't even know what I did the first time. But it allowed me to, to be creative through service and test a lot of ideas that now I use to help hundreds of people. So Teach to Learn has been has been great, and then that's how I met. I don't even know the first time we met. Do you remember when we met each other first? Probably time? late twenty seventeen. Late twenty seventeen. Probably, I I would say so. Yeah. Okay, so you you go through Sanica, you do your first year. Um. Yeah. So after my English uh, program, I went back home for a bit to apply for the study permit there. Okay. Once I made the decision, um, like I actually I applied while I was here. Uh, you couldn't do that, so I had to go back. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, like that, delayed my entrance into Seneca. But then, if I if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have met Alejandro because I would have gone to a different campus. Like, True. So it's one of those things where. And we wouldn't be here. Yeah, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah, for real. That's it's, insane. Yeah. <laughs> so that happened, and I had to go back, and then I came uh, with the study permit, and uh -huh. then later in that semester, like I just connected with these children teach to learn to get ready to do my placement next semester um, so we met like as I was starting to get connected to teach to learn in late 2017 and you start Seneca you you, you can so what's your journey been like you you completed the two years I did yes and then I remember then you helping us out when we were struggling so bad like Wang and I we had quit our jobs in 2017 and I remember like like teach to learn and North Year cards and you had culture link at the time would get us some workshops <laughs> and I, I we would love it so much because it gave us like some money to be able to survive <laughs> so what what was 2018 like um and on for you after after Seneca or was did you finish that program in 2019 or 20 I, I finished in 2019 um after like I, I became connected with each student through my placement but I'm still in touch with them today um, yeah, yeah and um, through them I met many people like doing community work um, so I did a placement like in another agency and then after I was done with the program uh, I started looking into what to do um, at this point like I had already done a couple of um, summer programs with them with children with youth um, I had done like a, a summer camp for like uh, people who were studying English as well. So after I finished school, I I was looking for a job, and that's how I I joined CultureLink, um, which is another great agency supporting newcomers from all over. Mm -hmm. um, I worked like um, doing work with youth, and it was very fulfilling as well. Um, so that was like my first full time job in my field. Um, and yeah, that's that's like what I did for for a while. Then the pandemic hit, things changed. Everything was online. Um, yeah. Since, <laughs> since we last connected, I remember um, you obviously you you helped us out with Culture Link, and we worked with them. That was amazing. And then you told me about this amazing thing that I want to talk to you about is is Project Canoe, mm. where I think throughout the pandemic or or during. You went to Algonquin Park with people who have experienced systemic barriers mm -hmm. to... So, it's uh, for the people who don't know, Algonquin Park is a huge park here in Ontario, Canada. And you took these people to canoe in, in this place. And typically, it was six people there, six, six people who were... Six youth. Six youth mm -hmm. and three... Staff. Staff. And you would be there for seven days, ten days at times. What was this experience like, and and 
how did you get into it? So when I was working with Project Canoe, my role was not like taking people on trips. I did go on trips, um, but my main responsibility was the youth outreach and intake, which is something that I really appreciated uh, getting the chance to do because it was being intentional about who we are reaching out to, um, to invite them to participate in these experiences and being mindful that um, it's important to create like meaningful partnerships with sectors that are very underrepresented in a space like outdoor education, which is like a very non-diverse space. Um, and so I became connected with Project Hanu actually through Teach to Learn because wow. <laughs> Teach to Learn had been working with them for like many, many years in the past, like as Project Hanu was also uh, a grassroots organization. Um, and they took Teach, like um, they do partnership trips where they partner up with different agencies and the agency takes their their group that's already like um, created um, mm. into the trips and so Project Hanu just helps uh, with the staff and the supervision and the logistics and they do a great work in like um, helping people get to these places while feeling supported as well for, because for example in the case of Teach to Learn many of our youth might not feel as comfortable speaking English um, people mm, some people don't point. speak any English because they just came here um, and so they need someone to like support them and uh, Project Canoe allowed for a staff member from Teach to Learn to come and support that person and Amazing. So, so. so tell me, tell me I, I, I'm so happy that I have you here because <laughs> as newcomers we come here and we hear about the systemic barriers and systemic barriers and we, and we don't even know that we're being, that we're part of that group with systemic barriers and at times I don't even know uh, what it means until I get some examples. So, for example, I talk to some of my my Latinx friends, and I'm like, "Have you ever been skiing?" They're like, "No." And I'm like, "How can you?" And then you realize it's like two hundred and fifty dollars to go skiing, and you can't go skiing. Okay, assuming you have the money, how do you get to the hill? You don't have a car. I didn't have a car till I was like thirty three, and and. And I got it because I had a baby that needed to go to daycare. And I got in debt to, to get that car, basically. We didn't have the money three years ago to, to, to get a car. And and a lot of these these things, you don't even realize. Okay, so let's assume you have the $250, which a lot of newcomers don't because that's like a quarter of rent or, or, or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So now that you mention it, going canoeing... I've never been canoeing in my life, <laughs> and I've been in Canada for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could say, like, oh, maybe because you're not adventurous. But really, I I know nobody that canoes. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of white friends that went to university that they canoed a lot. Mm -hmm. Because their parents canoed, or maybe they had a cottage, mm -hmm. or maybe their grandparents have a cottage, and, and they have cars, and... And they, they have a place to stay, and the knowledge to canoe has been handed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So, um, what? Wh how do you do the outreach, and, and what are these systemic barriers exactly? Do you have a couple of examples? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the example of like access to sports is is a is a good example. Uh, but just before we go into that, like there are so many more let's say more critical uh, barriers right like there's very real barriers that people from our community also experience i think we're very lucky in that also like part of our experience has been protected because of like our backgrounds in terms of like maybe class um, but i think like it's important to acknowledge that there is so many barriers that we didn't face that many people from our absolutely. community face as well right? absolutely which are like maybe well very critical in terms of like feeling uh, being discriminated when like trying to access housing or access like access to the market and getting precarious jobs although they might have docu like documentation to work legally in the country many many people are like pushed into the um, precarious job market what's precarious job um, market? where like you don't get benefits where you don't have access to like growth opportunities like what when you think of like um, an ideal job this is a job that doesn't have like benefits that maybe um, like cleaning floors well, that that's not necessarily a precarious job if you have benefits, have benefits for okay. example, or like you have access to EI or a pension, that sort of thing. Because then so if you're line, breaking cash under the table, mm -hmm. that's a precarious job. Yes, because there's no you're not documented, and you don't have not benefits. necessarily like you might be documented and and work that kind of job, because we are pushed into that because you don't have access to other sorts of uh, jobs. Like when you apply to a hundred jobs, and 
you don't get any. Uh, maybe other people from different backgrounds with the exact same experience as you do get those jobs because, because of systemic discrimination. And then you just resort to precarious jobs. Maybe that's I the get case. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if somebody's name was John Smith versus if their name was a very complicated Bangladeshi name, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that that would be an example. And they and the Bangladeshi does same experience, but the Bangladeshi person doesn't get a like not a one interview mm -hmm. with a hundred jobs. And and research shows that right. Like this is not like something. Yeah, we're up. not making this up. Here in Toronto, things are somewhat different because of the diversity we fight we have in the city but statistically in canada um, that is the, very much the case so like people are less likely to be hired if they have names that sound ethnically from a racialized country and so these are these are examples of systemic barriers in 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 the professional market but yeah. then maybe that ties into like access to sports because then what if like a yeah. family doesn't have access to these jobs that uh -huh. then could lead to like getting a car to be able to drive to Algonquin Park or exactly yeah like being able to take a few days off of work even mm -hmm. like if you don't have vacation pay if you don't have that kind of benefits then how are you gonna take so that really off? well ties into the canoeing everything does yeah everything is very connected like systemic barriers push people out of spaces um, where, where like those things are also connected to well-being right like when you're outdoors research shows that it's good for your mental health. Yeah. Um, it has so many benefits for your physical health as well. For like you to be able to create connections, uh, feel a sense of belonging to the country. Like obviously when you do like things that sound Canadian, like canoeing is like an indigenous, comes from an indigenous uh, history, right? Like, so anyways, that's that's a whole different conversation that we <laughs> can get into. But um, So how do you do, how does this reality affect the way you do the outreach? Um, it just it's something to keep in mind it's something to to keep in the in the back of your head because then you understand that certain communities are less likely to be able to go into these trips yeah are more have different barriers to that and this isn't only like um, for people who are newcomers to Canada but people also within Canada with like um, low incomes right uh, or that live in rural communities that might not have like not be not be uh, able to easily access uh, like I don't know a car or get to Algonquin Park or might not be like familiar with like how canoeing works um, mm -hmm. It's canoeing itself in it in and of itself. It's a huge logistic, right? Like you need to prepare um, Like health stuff like kids for cooking in the outdoors you need to be prepared for animals like bears you need to <laughs> like risk management There's there's so many things involved yeah. that and I didn't know any of this myself, right? Like I, I did so many uh, partnership trips with, with Teach to Learn and then later on with CultureLink, taking groups um, with Project Canoe into these spaces. And only until I worked for Project Canoe, I learned a little bit more yeah. <laughs> after going like to a few trips that summer of like understanding the logistics. So all of these things are maybe... And not, I know that, no. that also you mentioned before we, we started recording that it's not just the the systemic bar or the barriers to... to to being able to pay for it or to go but some but there's also barriers for people with <clears throat> with with mental health uh challenges that mm -hmm. that you provide opportunities to or, mm -hmm. or this this project canoe provides mm -hmm. opportunities mm -hmm. to right yeah if somebody else if somebody has maybe um i don't know like bipolar challenges or any other challenges that you also need staff that are aware and trained to because maybe you're in the middle of Argonquin Park and you need to be able to be well trained to, to mitigate or to handle specific situations yeah to support people through through hard moments yeah for sure I think um, as, as we were talking about like different barriers that those are also barriers right like the fact that people are not um, trained on how to handle certain behaviors also pushes people out of spaces because then they can't be supported properly in the way they need to to participate in an activity that they should be able to participate in. Um, it's what, like, mm -hmm. what projects have you seen or organizations that are doing a great job that, that, that you love that are doing a great job of, of kind of reducing these systemic barriers or that are doing really cool things that, that are not usually in the news? 
I think that happens a lot. <laughs> I can speak uh, about the ones that I've yeah, yeah the ones been that you very love. lucky to like, to work with, like Teach to Learn, Culture Link, Project Canoe. There's there's hundreds. I, I would recommend like anyone uh, in need of like services to go online and find Two One One Toronto. Two One One. Two One One Toronto. Yes, it's it's a great resource where you can filter by. Um, your postal code and the need of services that you that you're looking for the, the, the service area that you're looking to um, get services in it shows you a bunch of agencies that could serve you for free wow so that's two one one toronto.com yeah I don't know if it's that com, okay, but just, just Google, Google 211 Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> okay amazing I want to ask you your opinion on this little thing about Canada that I love and I think it's it's fantastic but you're more knowledgeable than I am on this and it's the the land acknowledgement so I had the opportunity to go to I think all all the best things in my life have happened because of service because I did something for free and because I was passionate something happened and then something happened then something happened and and because of my resume critique workshop that we did firstly at Teach to Learn. Then because of Teach to Learn, I got to hear about Art Starts and Julian Carvajal. And then I won a grant for the resume critique workshop. It was only like $2,500, but to, to deliver a resume critique workshop at Art Starts for, for a bunch of uh, people trying to, we were translating their resumes from Spanish to English. And because of that, I got invited to a young leaders conference by the water and because of there I met a, a keynote speaker that day who crazy just I arrived early we started talking and one thing led to another and then she was like hey I love your story you want to come to Malaysia to do a TEDx talk <laughs> and I was like what <laughs> so that's how Huang and I went to Malaysia but the more important part about that story is that 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 young leaders conference addressed so many things that I had no idea were happening in Canada, mm -hmm. like the residential schools mm -hmm. and, and the land acknowledgement that I, I knew the land acknowledgement because I had seen it, but I didn't really know truth and reconciliation and, and everything that had happened. And there were a lot of indigenous peoples at this conference and it was, a um, there were a lot of circles to where you would have vulnerable conversations and people would cry and I was like where have I been this whole time I had no idea so for for the people listening you correct me if I'm wrong but so Canada had a history of residential schools and where they would try to I don't even know if this is the right word, like indoctrinate or they would take the indigenous people's children away from them and put them into residential schools so that they would believe in the Catholic God or uh, and I don't even know what the word, there was a word like re, I don't even know what the word was, but to like make them the way that they want it to be like the people in, in the government and they would put them there and a lot of kids went missing a lot of kids were sexually abused physically abused they've found like mass burial mass graves under these residential schools and the last one was closed in like 1996 so i was like what and a lot of people including myself when i first arrived in canada and I'm not proud of this, but like when I went to U of T, there was like in Spadina and Spadina and, and Bloor, there was always like indigenous peoples, um, like drunk on the streets and like yelling stuff at me and other people. Now and, and I was just like, who are, why are they always drunk? These people are just so irresponsible. But I had no idea that the uh, the the substance abuse. And the, the drug abuse and the alcohol abuse is just a symptom of decades long of abuse from these uh, uh, PT, like 
post-traumatic stress syndrome and a lot of these things that they, they were abused for decades, maybe over a century, th this group of people. And no wonder, like, uh, no wonder they, they, they're, they have so many challenges. And the land acknowledgement ties into this a, a little bit where as Canadians, we've, or the government and as Canadians, they've decided to acknowledge that we came into this land that was not ours. So what what's what's your take on it? And and can, can you add a little bit more of context into the residential schools and everything? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not an indigenous person. I'm not indigenous to Canada, uh, nor, nor in Colombia. Um, so I can share what I've learned, yeah. uh, which has been taught to me um, by like the education system here uh, and also like by indigenous people that I've connected with. Um, but I encourage everyone to go do their own research and read and, and learn about the land that they're on um, because we are all on indigenous land, right? Yeah. Even like, I don't know about like the history of indigenous people in Costa Rica, but I know like Bogota is like where Muisca's community lived and Bogota, the name Bogota comes from the word Bacata and like we all have indigenous, um, we all live in indigenous land and exist yeah. in indigenous land. So I encourage everyone to go and do their own research. Um, so my my learning journey about indigenous issues started with land acknowledgement, uh, yeah. which is which is why I I personally think that they are important because I remember feeling completely blown away by the first land acknowledgement that I heard in class. Um, I, as most immigrants, I would say, like having worked with many immigrants. Um, have never heard that there were indigenous people in Canada before coming to Canada and learning about yeah. it. Yeah. Because um, we never thought about it. And and Canada also doesn't advertise um, its history of abuse and colonization towards indigenous people. Um, and so my journey started by listening to Alana Glunchment and wondering what that meant. And hearing names that at the time I, I didn't know what they meant that I couldn't pronounce, that sounded new to me. Like what? Like Anishinaabe? Like Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, um, which are like the nations that lived and live in this land still today, um, whose, ter whose traditional territories we're on. Um, so being curious about that, like what does that mean? What ha why have I never heard of this? Um, and that um, intrigued me and made me take courses and reach out to like community centers that work with indigenous communities um, and go to reserves and like um, You've been learn. to reserves? Yes, yeah, I've been to Six Nations a couple of times. And how was that experience? Very nice, very nice. Um, I, I was able to go with, uh, with, with a, a community worker um, that has been to Six Nations for many many years and he does work about like making connections with immigrant and indigenous nations um, to establish friendships and so that we are also part of the process of reconciliation because if we don't know about this and sometimes for many people this might start with an acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, we can't participate in re reconciliation um, so so going back to like what I've learned it's as you were saying there's been a long history of abuse of indigenous communities in Canada um, part of that was residential schools but that's not the one thing right like there's also been um, even arguably today, like the, the overrepresentation of indigenous children in the child welfare system is very much linked to colonization. It's not um, like a coincidence that there is still in the in the child welfare system so many indigenous kids because their parents are deemed by the state maybe not fit, um, and this comes from residential schools, right? Yeah, like if you, if you if you don't if you're taken away from your family. And you're educated in an environment like funded by the government and run by the churches and different churches um, where you experience abuse where you're yeah like abuse in so many so many different ways where um, it's just like incredibly outrageous um, where are you gonna get the parenting skills to to start your own family <laughs> or insane. and then that ties into like how do you cope with the trauma if there are no supports and if 
like even today we know that um, indigenous women are disappearing like it's a national emergency in Canada uh, they are killed they're they disappear there is little investigation from from the RCMP like there is so many issues uh, and, and ways in which today is still indigenous communities are um, marginalized and, and oppressed so I think it's very interesting to to learn, and I encourage everyone to like go read indigenous authors and and listen to the great activism that they're doing, um, and and wonder about like how can I, from an immigrant perspective, which all, we are also settlers, right? Like we're mm-hmm. also uninvited guests. We are also we applied to like the government of Canada's uh, citizenship and on residence and like all of these things. We we are also participating and benefiting from the process of colonization by living in this land, right? Um, to wonder and to look into how we can help the, like help improve those conditions or disrupt the conditions that continue how can marginalizing. We? How do how how do you think <laughs> I know this is a whole nother <laughs> podcast but but it's important because I reached out thank and thank you to Julian Carvajal who at the time connected me with an incredible indigenous artist and it really broke my heart, man. It really broke my heart to listen to all these stories of sexual abuse and just... And they, and they were saying, like, I'm tired of these apologies. I'm tired of, of people pitying us. I'm tired just, like, let us be. And to just t- touch on the land acknowledgement, again, for people who maybe don't know what we're talking about, it's... A land acknowledgement or territorial acknowledgement, I'm reading Google here, is a formal statement that a public event is taking place on land inhabited by indigenous peoples. So in that time, in that meeting, they also talked about truth truth and reconciliation. Reconciliation. uh, And Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission active in Canada from 2008 to 2015, organized by the parties of Indian, of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. So my, my understanding of that day is just that there was so much damage made that it's not going to take a year or 10 years or 30 years to fix that's why they call it truth and reconciliation. First, there was a big, like a big wound that had to be opened to bring out the truth. And you can't reconcile without the truth. And man, I was, I was, I, like so many people were in tears that, that day. It was like a two or three day, late, uh, day event in 2018. And uh, now that I'm a dad, I, I couldn't even believe, like fathom. If the government showed up at my door and just took Liam, could you fucking imagine hmm. how fucking crazy that is? I c- and and I I'm agnostic myself, and I I'm I don't know how people in the name of God could could have done these things. I just I just don't even. Don't mm-hmm. even know. What's what's your relationship to that? Do you believe in God? That's a good question. I or what's your relationship to God and, and the cat and, and the I Catholic think, Church and, and this whole yeah. Thing? I think that I I'm a spiritual person. Uh, I definitely have like a connection with like um, Creator, like however you want to call it. Um, but my relationship with with that is like I, I've learned that it's not only like. A religious agenda that they were trying to push like there is it's a white supremacist agenda too like the racial component was very crucial to this right like they had in the legislation the Indian Act which is still um, like a legislation that's part of uh, the Canadian system um, when they created the residential schools it said killing the Indian in the child that was the objective yes I heard of that. the of the law and and so and again, like this is just something that happened after many years of other policies. Like there were uh, policies that banned, um, like people from participating in their uh, rituals and like doing powwows and sun dances. Um, there were laws that, like the past system, where they were how how do you think like we we're able to 
exist in this land, right? Like there were some treaties in, in many areas in the country, but um, all communities were also pushed into like reserves, which were considered less desirable areas um, where they would be like monitored by the RCMP, which was created like among other things for that purpose of like controlling the indigenous, controlling wow. the indigenous communities and like uh, monitoring that they were not passing like the the edges of like the research so like there's so many things to learn about to understand um like the history of the country right because i think it's also like our responsibility um as people who will you're canadian like i i, I think i hopefully <laughs> will become canadian somewhat soon uh like to, to help improve and address these things because like the fact that a community is oppressed um harms everyone right absolutely it like imagine Imagine all the things that Europeans could have learned um, from indigenous communities and the way they inhabited these lands for thousands of years, taking care of it, existing in it. Like, where are we at with global change? Where are we at with so many things that wouldn't have happened or would be so different if we ha if they had learned um, from the ways that people practice here, like being experts in this land, existing here for thousands of years. So, like, the fact that they p didn't pay attention to that or, or, or didn't learn or just deemed it um, less valuable because it being different, um, it's like, I think we all need to look into how we can help build things differently. And as newcomers, as Latin, because I find that I'm not, like, excusing our behavior but I do recognize that when we first come here, we're like, bro, I'm just trying to survive myself. I can't worry about what happened before my time. And like uh, 50 years or 100 years, it's not my fault that these people did this in res the residential schools. I'm just trying to have a better life because I come from Venezuela or Colombia or Costa Rica or Mexico. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to flee violence there or or drug um drug violence or or the dictatorship in venezuela so a lot of a lot of people are just trying to flee and now you're asking them and now we're asking them to like worry or do something about what canada did which we're not to blame but at the same time we're we live here now it. we are benefiting from it we're benefiting and we are here now mm -hmm. and how can we be more responsible to not just be like, oh, I'm just here to have a good time and blah, 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 and I'm going to ignore everything that happened before me. What can we do mm -hmm. as newcomers apart from doing the research, which I think it's a very mm -hmm. good first step. Yeah. Um, the person who introduced me um, to, I remember like, a very welcoming family, uh, a Mohawk family in Six Nations. This person is a person who came from Guatemala as a refugee. Um, and he created those connections himself and wow. he, he established relationships with communities. So, like, I think it's a matter of being intentional about, about how can we help fix things that are not right. Like, as you were saying, like, when you are downtown and you see people who are experiencing several challenges, how can you just, like, be indifferent to that like there i think there's a need to like cultivate empathy in humanity um and in terms of like the concrete actions i remember i was introduced to to a text um which was written i don't remember the name of the author but uh, this person wrote like for the 150th um confederation anniversary um they wrote like 150 calls to action that people could do to learn about these issues and like help advance reconciliation. Uh, so I recommend you all to like look it up. You can look it up. It's like I think 150 calls to action or reconciliation acts, something like that. Um, but it, it says like try to read from an indigenous author uh, yeah. and learn. Um, try go to like uh, an indigenous friendship center. That's like I went to one at um, Spadina and Bloor. Um, Yes, and like I would love to go. Yeah, so there is there is a lot of ways um, that you can. Well, also like you can't expect someone to welcome you just because you're interested, right? Like you need to be intentional and respectful, and it's a, it's a relationship. Um, so like 
I don't know. This is no no manual. <laughs> this is just like from my experience, <laughs> what I've learned. Like, yeah, how yeah, I've tried yeah. not being an expert myself and just like navigating navigating that because I think, um, yeah, empathy is needed and and you you have to act. Um, being critical of yourself and Absolutely. learning and yeah, it's a process. I want to ask you about this Latinx. To me. I'm going to read this Google because it's been controversial a little bit. <laughs> and Latinx, based on Google. Um, a person of Latin American origin or descent used as gender neutral or non binary alternative to Latino or Latina. Um, Latinx is a neologism in American English which is used to refer to people of Latin American cultural or ethnic identity in the United States, the gender, gender neutral X suffix replaces the O or A ending of Latino and Latina that are typical of grammatical gender in Spanish. Its plural is Latinxes. So to me, <laughs> it's very simple. Sometimes I use Latinos because I it's just... I've been saying it for decades, but Latinx is just inclusive and it's one letter and to me it's just a very simple way of being empathetic for people who have been marginalized or been persecuted. It's also very friendly for the LGBT community and some people have not have opportunities because of their sexual orientation or just because they identify gender mm -hmm. ge their gender I identity and if I can be friendly and empathetic by using Latinx a lot of people say like no I'm not Latin I'm like bro this is just we're ch you're included in this I'm not excluding you mm -hmm. by saying Latinx I'm, I'm, this is the biggest of umbrellas and to me, it's not a big deal. I've received with not working to networking. And even on my posts, sometimes on LinkedIn, like, oh, the Latinx, some people get offended by it. You shouldn't use it. And I'm like, listen, if, if you get offended because I'm trying to be inclusive, I think you should, you should, I don't know, you should, you should check. Look into why. You look into it. And, and, uh, and I'm not saying you have to use it. I'm just saying I'm using it. It's. To me, it's just a, 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 it's a love always wins. It's uh, being inclusive. What's your take on it? Yeah, I think um, like language is always changing, and yeah. as as I've learned a lot about like um, indigenous issues, I've questioned about like our own background, like in Latin America and for Colombia, like being uh, colonized by Spaniards. Um, I question like Spanish is also a colonized language, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Why do I English feel too? I guess yeah, yeah, absolutely, for sure, of course. Um, and so it's like before, like I felt very um, like proud about like writing well or like speaking well or like whatever it was. But it's like, what does well mean, and why do I feel the need to uphold like whatever the rise is, like those rules? Like I don't know. Like language is always changing. Maybe my mind will change in the future. I don't know. But um, like to me. Being inclusive is a win-win situation. Like, why why would I not use a term that is more inclusive than another? It's like saying, in, instead of like calling a person in a police car like the policeman, you're saying the police, the police, or the police person. Yeah. Like, why? What impact why does that this have? Because a lot of people think it doesn't have an impact. But the are there any studies that you've heard where, like, by saying, eh, "el doctor." Does that have an imp the uh, because in Spanish we have the gender pronouns and articles so el doctor means that the doctor is is, is a male. Are there any studies that that might suggest that by doing that we're excluding or um, because I like saying the police person mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. than the police mm -hmm. man because you don't know their or the gender. businessman you know? and it's not yeah it's not relevant like their gender is not relevant to their job right. And you don't know, like, their gender, too. So why are you assuming? <laughs> anyway. That's true. Like, and, and that has to do, like, how we are socialized to think, like, oh, a police person is more likely to be a man because there's, like, also 
I don't know much about this, like, uh, but I'm assuming there might be some challenges for, like, women to get into the police. And that's also, like, because of the way we're socialized. And, and there's so many things that go into play about, like, into that. But um, I think I haven't read those studies, but my understanding, not being an expert again, is, like, this term, Latinx, was created um, by the LGBTQ plus community, like, trans people or non-binary people that didn't feel seen in Latino, Latina, um, came up with this and this is all inclusive so like why would I not use it like and, and yeah. that's changing too like lately I think that uh, some people are advocating for like using Latine like maybe that will change in the future but to me it's like I'll learn and I'll unlearn and like what I'm trying to do is acknowledge that there's people who are not represented in the way we use language and I want to include them because they are people who deserve to be included exactly. just like everyone does no, to me, it's a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. I recognize that I know use it all the time, but there's, it's, it's very important that we don't fall into this like status of like, oh, if, if you don't use Latinx, you're a horrible person. Cause there's other ways to be inclusive. I just picked to say Latinx, but there's other ways in which people can can't. Like if my grandma doesn't use it, that doesn't mean that she's a bad person. You know what I mean. <laughs> but at the same time, there's other ways that we can do outreach, and that we can reduce the barriers to entry and to opportunities. What are other What are other things that you that you can recommend to people to to continue to do when they're here to be more inclusive, even though we're just getting into this country. Mm-hmm. Um, I think becoming aware of, of social issues is a lifelong journey. Um, yeah. And it's, it's about like being interested in, in being more inclusive because, and understanding that it matters because people matter. Like, yeah. Um, so like thinking about like tangible things, I can, I can think of like the best practices that we use in like the community work, um, feel which are for example like when introducing yourself state your pronouns so that mm -hmm. the other person doesn't have to assume you're saying hey my name is this i use this and this pronouns uh so that the other person doesn't have to assume and then if there's a person who doesn't subscribe to like conventional he or she pronouns they don't feel like it's like they they are the only ones who have to say my pronouns are they them for example or whatever their pronouns are right like so yeah, it's if like everybody says out, them, you're yeah. not the out, outcast. Yeah, you're not like the only one that's uh, saying that. So like making a space inclusive, which takes like what one, two seconds from our time to like say our pronouns. Um, I think like being more intentional about like um, gender neutral language in general. Um, but I think something to keep in mind is like using the most updated language doesn't make you... Um, like an ally necessarily mm -hmm. or like a, a, That's a, a very good person point. right like w what does it matter if I use gender neutral language but then in my day to day practice like if I'm a manager and then in my day to day practices I only hire people with a certain background or if I on the street like I just have like unconscious bias or like I I feel negatively towards certain people so I will only sit next to like I don't know whatever um, person because of that like it's it's not about like language only language is part of it but mm -hmm. it's about learning and unlearning about how you can be more inclusive and um respectful to others and kind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're going now to to trinidad mm -hmm. and then you're going to france <laughs> i think you're like an encyclopedia of opportunities <laughs> like if, if there's a one person that i call all the time that knows people or opportunities or ways it's always you how how have you always got i mean not, not gotten these amazing opportunities because I've, you, you've earned them but how did where is a good way to research apart from 211 toronto or like what are you doing in trinidad and what are you doing in 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 france mm -hmm. and how did you hear of these opportunities um I'm going to train that for a class for school, the, the, the university I go to. Um, I study part-time, I study social work part-time now, That uh, like after some time of doing community work. 
I became a permanent resident and so I recently went back to school part-time for social work and at my school um, they launched this program um, it's called Global Justice and Change and uh, they offered like scholarships for, for people to go and uh, take these courses um, that had a component of traveling um, so I, I heard about this opportunity through email like I got I got an email from my school and so I looked into it and I applied I think a lot of people don't apply to so many opportunities that exist out there because of various reasons um, but I think it's very important to apply if you're eligible for it because being eligible for it is such a huge privilege like for the longest time not being a permanent resident mm -hmm. although I was interested in all of these things that I I'm now able to do, I couldn't, like, I would, uh, trust me, if, if I had these opportunities, <laughs> like, in the past, I, I would have you taken would them. <laughs> Mars right now. Yeah. Um, but I think, like, being eligible for them is a huge privilege, so if you're interested, go for it. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing in Trinidad, and then for France, I'm going there to study, um, French and I also got this opportunity through through the school um, they offered like through another, your school through my school yeah correct what to the Metropolitan right TMU, Metropolitan, yeah uh -huh. mm -hmm. formerly known as Ryerson mm -hmm. which I think just goes to show how Canada can actually move so it was called Ryerson before mm -hmm. but correct me if I'm wrong Ryerson was a the guy was like a slave owner or a slave or I think, what's the what why did it change i think he participated don't quote me on this <laughs> i think he participated in the design of uh, the residential school system oh I think, wow i think that is the case um i'm not 100 percent aware of of the story to be honest um but it, i think it goes to show that names can change and, and yeah can change. so for people who don't know this is one of the biggest universities in canada and it was called ryerson and the public, when this came about, that he was allegedly involved in this in the um, residential school programs, or a pioneer maybe, people went crazy to the point that there was so much pressure that they changed the name of the university. Mm -hmm. That's how much people matter. And and if if you're actually, you have to speak up. Yeah, I think to add to that, something important is that this had been known for a while, right? Like, it's not like we just yeah, found like, out that this yeah. person took, like, a very important... Because this was not something small. Like, this was probably a huge deal back in the day when, when this came to be. And it was a, a powerful position to design this or be involved yeah. in, in whatever way it was. And communities have been pushing for this for years. Like, people were speaking... Uh, about why this needed to happen but until I think a, a year or a couple of years ago when uh, like uh, the graves of many many children yes. were discovered in in Western Canada um, there was like more advocacy about this and it came to the point where the university decided to change its name but this had been spoken about for many years mm. uh, and like advocacy had been happening mm -hmm. With all the good that you're doing on this planet, <laughs> what do you, what do you struggle with? What do you what do you uh, what keeps you up at night? I think I worry about the future. Um, I think because there's so many opportunities out there, I I wanna take advantage of as many of them as I would like as I, as I can. Um, and I think it's it's hard for me to like decide um, strategically which ones will take me to where I want to be and also like figuring out where I want to be because of what I was mentioning earlier about how there's so many things that need to happen in the world um, and there's so many ways to address those things I'm, I'm still I think trying to find um, where my role is to to help advance change in like a bigger scale but also feeling fulfilled and working with vulnerable people and maybe traveling um, as, as part of that too and learning. I am still figuring that out, so I think I think about that a lot. <laughs> Where do you... Wh what really, really drives you? What really, like, what's so close to heart within the huge social work umbrella? 
Is it refugees? Is it mm-hmm. is it people of of vulnerable peoples? Is it the indigenous peoples? Is it helping Latinx people? Is it housing? Is it uh, welfare? What like what part? Because I know that you want to help everybody, <laughs> but what part do you love working with? I think if you could do it for the rest of your life. I think for the for. For most of my time uh, involved in community work, I have really, really, really enjoyed learning and working with refugees. Um, mm-hmm. So, like while doing settlement work, I worked with um, many like refugee youth and their families, um, and it's it's been very, very interesting. I've really appreciated that. that. So maybe. Like I don't know, speaking out loud here, I'm thinking like maybe UNHCR. Um, What's that? Uh, the UN Agency for Refugees. It's the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Oh they, yeah, uh, that's why you need to talk to my sisters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, I think um, that's a huge organization doing very meaningful work. Um, that sounds very appealing to me. Mm, but there's so many others. Like there's there's so I think. I think I'm still figuring out where it's because even even within that organization, like there's so many yeah things you can do, right? To so, me, uh, <laughs> I I hear you talking. Uh, I think of Britney Spears. All I need is time. The moment that is mine. While I'm in between, so <laughs> I'm not a girl, <laughs> not yet a woman. <laughs> So, all the Britney Spears fans listening to us, you're welcome. <laughs> to me, when I do the, when I do, what I do with not working to networking, shout out to Lau, who is uh, Juan Camilo's roommate and who's on our team. To me, the reason why I started this, not working to networking, where we host weekly industry-specific workshops to help Latinx people increase their professional network and help others in the process. We've hosted like over a hundred meetups and helped hundreds of Latinx people to get interviews, internships, and jobs since 2021. To me, like what drives me is to think like, man, the, they have, it's just, they have the talent they have the skills and they're eating so much shit just because they don't know of this opportunity and if i could just remove that barrier boom their life is amazing in canada mm-hmm. and it's crazy how i see so much so many people going through hard times here and and they it's just all they need is somebody to be like hey actually i know this person who needs somebody like you why don't you talk and then magic happens mm-hmm. and because I, I enjoy connecting people so much I have picked this niche part that I love doing which is meeting people connecting people and listening to people's stories and I've been able to help hundreds of people how crazy is that we've been able to help mm-hmm. hundreds of people so the, the reason why I asked you is because sometimes we try to, and I'm not saying this is you, but in general, because it's happened to me before, and we're trying to tackle such a big problem that we could just start with our neighborhood. You know what I mean? Yes. And all that time and energy yes. and attention and resources that you're like, oh yeah, but how am I going to like tackle global warming? I'm like, just plant a hundred trees uh, or, like a, or like a tree. Mm-hmm, in mm-hmm, in the backyard mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. something or recycle yeah. or uh, don't buy plastic like a lot of these things you can do so <laughs> obviously I would try I would love to, to I would love to help everybody get a better job but guess what I enjoy the most helping my own community and because I have so many friends in I guess white collar jobs and I started with banking that was my first meetup in HR Mm -hmm. and then it evolved into so many industries Mm -hmm. that now we've built something amazing Mm -hmm. and sometimes you just start with what you love and see where it leads you know yeah start where you're at 
Start where you're at, 100%. Mm-hmm. So the last question of this interview, my friend, is the question that everybody gets, and it's the champagne question. And if it goes like this, if we were to meet a year from now with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating in Juan Camilo's life? That's a good question. Thank you. That's what I do. <laughs> I think um, a year from now, I I hope to be a Canadian citizen. Yeah. Um, and well, let's think. <laughs> For the next little while, I'm gonna be in school. Um, I think, hopefully, if we were to meet a year from now. Um, I would have a very meaningful job that's impacting people's lives um, and make me feel very making me feel very fulfilled. And if you could if you could have any job, what would that job be? If I if I didn't have to be in school, yeah, if you didn't have to be it, in school, it would be like um, somewhere else. I don't know where, like somewhere different in the world. Maybe um, working with vulnerable communities. Maybe like youth. Um, Maybe like implementing programs or designing programs. I'm I'm still figuring what that looks like. So that's but that's like kind of like what I ambition. But I don't Europe, know. Latin America, Africa. Somewhere that I haven't been. So maybe maybe Africa or Asia or maybe Latin America. Um, or in a place that I've haven't been. That's amazing. Maybe. Or in the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm still trying. I think <laughs> I'm in between. one thing that I wanted to add. I think like the, the opportunities that I mentioned earlier were like. Um, in, like related to my school but there is so many other opportunities out there that are not necessarily linked with another institution right like mm-hmm. the government of Canada has many opportunities out there for people to learn French for example like with the um, official languages program or for people who are French speakers who want to improve their English uh, they can participate in that like reach out to a community agency there's settlement workers if you're a newcomer or there's uh, like resource workers or um, like case managers that can help you find a program that fits your needs for people who are trying to get into like a job market or for people who are trying to network with uh, people like in the social services field I don't know like there's so many opportunities that um, exist out there so reach out to someone who might have access to those opportunities so someone at a community center or if you're in school like at your school or like your connections or not working networking or like somehow ask ask the questions reach out do your own google search because there's so many opportunities out there like if you are eligible use it use it because many people are not like i i have yeah. many people who would give everything to participate in in these opportunities but they're not eligible um, so if you are, take advantage of those things and, and spread the word as well. And even if you're not eligible, anybody can volunteer. Mm-hmm. Anybody mm-hmm. can volunteer. Mm-hmm. All right, my friends. Well, JCP changing lives right here. All the tips that we got, all the change that you're making. Maybe 20 years from now, you'll be the Secretary General of the United <laughs> Nations and I'll, I'll have the first ever interview with JCP. All right, my friend Juan Camilo Poea and Stefan Dyer on the Stefan Dyer podcast. Thank you so much. See you next time. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer podcast. Arrivederci, my people.